So again, let me explain why I decided to cut the course from four journeys to three journeys. <coughs> it so happened that the first three journeys, the Egyptian multiplication, the greatest common measure, and eating one, I was also able to tell you a history of a fairly significant part of mathematics, very brief history, not very deep, uh, maybe somewhat broad, of number theory, abstract algebra, and set theory and logic. Yes? And when I looked at the, f my planned fourth journey, what I realized that while I had some very interesting algorithms, I couldn't quite find a matching part, something as impressive mathematically as what I did, as what I did uh, during the first three journeys. And uh, the central idea there, sort of using binary representation of integer as a data structure thing, is actually fairly well covered in Elements of Programming, the book you heard so many times. Uh, and uh, I decided that it's, it's better to, to limit the course with, with, to, with the three journeys. So now, of course, I have a very difficult task. I have to explain to you again why I did it and what it leads to and things like that, sort of an epilogue. So let me try to do it in a very informal way. I decided not to use many slides. I think I convinced you that I actually can make slides. <laughs> that is, uh, it's not because I'm lazy, but because I decided to make it a little bit more personal and less formal than before. So again. I actually do believe that mathematics is a wonderful thing, central to our civilization, and central to our profession, central to computer science. As a matter of fact, I go as far as to claim that computer science is a part of mathematics. And the unfortunate separation between mathematics and computer science is actually hurts both. It's very bad for mathematicians that they do not understand what we do. And it's very bad for us that we don't understand what they do. Uh, it's not the first time it happens. Sort of uh, early 20th century, there was a rather dramatic separation between physics and mathematics. People like Hilbert or Poincaré were both first class great mathematicians and great physicists. Then the world sort of separated. And it seems to be a part of this modern progress. We know more, therefore we need more and more specialized people. Even in computer science, we no longer have a general purpose computer scientists. We have people who specialize in uh, type theory, that is a theory for designing programming languages, except they know nothing about programming languages or programming, we, and so on. So we have very narrow, narrow stacks and nobody talks to each other and that's of course is very very bad uh, again one of the things in which I do believe is that uh, there is some fundamental unity of our knowledge it's actually good to to know other things that you are going to be a better programmer if you learn about Greek drama you say how how could it possibly be it is Somehow there is this unity of our intellectual universe. And more we know, better we are. It is a difficult, it is a difficult thing nowadays, but nevertheless I, I do believe that. So I attempted to show you different people. You know, we talked about some ancient Greeks, we talked about some people in medieval Italy, we talked about some people in Göttingen. So uh, the question is, what, what is the take out of all of that? Uh, one possible interpretation is that uh, you have to go and read all the books Alex read. Uh, no, guys. Again, there is something I have to say. You have to admire me, but do not imitate me. <laughs> that is, this is not a good path. If you read too many books, you just get very confused and forget everything. This is, this is true. So this is, this is not the lesson. 
So, we, so what is the lesson? Maybe it's that we indeed should all go and to become better programmers, uh, study Greek historians. And you say, oh, this is utterly mad idea. It cannot possibly work. Well, believe it or not, there is a clear proof that it does work. There was a great empire quite recently called British Empire. And guess what they did? They conquered the world by training their civil servants in ancient Greek historians. The best qualification, apparently, for governing India was a good knowledge of Herodotus. Well, everybody was making fun of them, but the empire did expand. And they did rule most of the world. The sun would never set on the British Empire, as we, some of us remember, at least Paul and I remember that, those days. But <coughs> so might Tom. Uh, but now it does set, and we could literally say that uh, if we look at the curve of sort of classical education in Eton and other places, it goes up and down with the British Empire. When they abandoned Latin, they effectively abandoned the empire. Is it a coincidence? I don't know. But nevertheless, that's not what I'm trying to tell you to do. Again, it's too late. The classical knowledge as it was done by 19th century. British is gone. It cannot be restored. But nevertheless, sort of what is, what is the outcome? How, how, what do you do after you are done with this course? Do you just forget all of that? Or do you do something? And I actually claim there is a path. There is a very important path which you should take. And before I Describe it, I have to talk about <coughs> an important idea which, which, which is behind what I'm going to, to talk about. The idea of a canon. Uh, it's a Greek word, sort of means a measuring yard, a measuring stick. Uh, was used by, say, Aristotle in, in that sense. Uh, eventually, it started to mean some body or work against which we measure other things. Right? And let me say the following thing, which I believe is true, that you cannot have a civilized society unless you have a canon. Civilizations go together with some canon. For example, Greek civilization, which lasted a very long time, till 1453, you have to figure out why till 1453, uh, was based, the fall of Constantinople, uh, was based on a canon of two books, Iliad and Odyssey. Every child, every Greek-speaking child, had to study literally almost till he knew by heart, for maybe eight years, these two texts. Again, that was the foundation of the civilization, which lasted a very long time. And uh, the idea that it is important for, for the modern society, or at least for American society, is not new. There were at least two great figures in American educational, educational establishment which tried to do it. And I'm sure you never heard of them. Therefore, I have to tell you about them. The first one is probably the greatest educational reformer in American history by the, na by the name of Charles William Eliot. Relatively easy to remember his last name. He was a cousin of T.S. Eliot, an elder cousin. Uh, he was probably the greatest president of Harvard, uh, Harvard University ever had. When he became a president of Harvard uh, in uh, 1869, Harvard was minor provincial school with no great scholars, with no great agenda. And its task was to educate uh, children of rich Bostonians. It basically was targeting this specific social class. And Charles Eliot realized that United States was in desperate straits, that 
you know, something needed to be done to educate the country. He just spent, he, he was fairly young, he was about 32, 33, which is amazing to become president of Harvard at 32 or 33. They don't do it anymore. But uh, what he did before he became president of Harvard, he spent several years going through Europe, studying European educational system, trying to understand why, what, what was good, what was bad. He came back. Uh, he became a professor of chemistry. He was a mathematician and chemist by training at MIT and published an article uh, at Atlantic, which at that time was the uh, most intellectual sort of uh, magazine in the United States, explaining what needs to be done with the educational system. Therefore, the board of Harvard decided to make him the president, and he decided to change Harvard. And the change he sort of forced in Harvard, he remained the president for about uh, 40 years. Again, very, very long term. It's very good when you become president very young. You could stay for very long. He changed dramatically <coughs> both whom he hired. He hired many foreigners, people from not from Boston, again, based on their great intellectual accomplishments. He hired research faculty first. Secondly, well, he started bringing students from all over the United States and later on even from Europe based on merit, again, not based on connections or wealth, but on merit. So Harvard became the leading university, and the idea of doing whatever Eliot was doing at Harvard sort of spread throughout American educational system. So this is why I'm telling you about him. I mean, you know, many great things which we have now are due to him. But eventually, toward the end of his tenure at Harvard, he realized that he has to go beyond, beyond uh, just educating uh, you know, rich or clever. He decided that he had to educate the entire country. So it's a remarkable idea, trying to change the educational level of, of the entire country. So he, uh, first he gave a speech, uh, but then he came up with the following wonderful proposal, that he personally will select five feet of books. Five feet that much. And if you read this five feet, you will be as well an educated person as a Harvard man. And Harvard man at that time meant something. And uh, he started, he started with, together with commercial partners, this thing which became known and was very prominent in the first half of the 20th century as Harvard Classics. Some of you might have seen this wonderful set of 51 volumes where he selected what he thought would turn you into a well-educated person. And uh, it was a good try. And indeed, millions of copies of the set were sold. You could pick them up occasionally in some garage sale for like 50 bucks. And might do you some good if you do. Uh, but again, it didn't quite work. I will explain why it didn't work a little bit later, at least my theory. But he started this idea that there is a core, there is a necessity for the canon which every American needs to know. So, and then comes the second figure, which made even greater effort, uh, maybe even greater failure in many respects, by the name of Mortimer Adler. Okay. Mortimer Adler was a Jewish kid from Brooklyn uh, who was born around 1900. Uh, by the way, lived well till about year 2000. So he died when he was almost 100 years old. And by the end, while he was born in Manhattan, he died in San Mateo. At the end of his life, he decided that the best place to be is the valley. So moved to San Mateo, but uh, sort of uh, eventually, when he was fairly young, he became a friend with uh, 
Robert Hutchins, who became a very famous president of University of Chicago. And two of them, while at Chicago, came up with an idea that they have to define the canon. There was a great Adler Hutchins, sort of the books of the Western world, great books of the Western world, which was an idea of sort of really defining the canon and assuring that every businessman in the country, every lawyer, every teacher, everybody will know and study all these books. So they came up <coughs> with a plan. And uh, the first, it has two editions. It's sort of the first time when they published it, which was, I believe, was in 1953 or something about that time. Uh, uh, it was 54 volumes. And then they changed it somewhere around 1990 with the second edition when it became 60 volumes, where they included what they believed are all the great books of the Western world. And if you read them, you're going to be really wise. And they had a wonderful, wonderful sort of idea to make it a big deal. For example, they specially printed two first sets in a very special cover and gave the first set as a present to the Queen Elizabeth II. And the second set they gave to President of the United States at the time. So it probably was 52, not 53. Uh, Harry Truman. Eisenhower probably wouldn't take the books. He was a general. Uh, at the time, actually, Eisenhower, what was his job before he became the president? Anybody knows? Before he became the president? Before he became the president. He was the general of the uh, after. after. After that. What, were, uh, what was he in 1952? Amazing job. He was the president of Columbia University. And uh, the, I couldn't resist to tell you this story because when he was elected to be the president of Columbia University, he assembled the faculty, he came up and he said, Employee of employees of Columbia University. Could you imagine how the faculty reacted? They were not the employees, but he didn't know. Uh, but in any case, Eisenhower was a wonderful president, nothing. Uh, in any, you know, we're going back to the great books of the Western world. So the, the idea was to define a canon, and they included literature and philosophy and science. Again, the, the collection included many great books of which we heard, it including books by Euclid, it included books by Galileo, by Newton, by heat diffusion by Fourier, it, it was a wonderful collection of fundamental books. And the idea, if you read all of them, all 54 books, you will be a well-educated person. They failed. That is, many people bought the book. Eventually, by my estimate, maybe close to a million Americans, which is an enormous number, bought the set. But it was a failure. Why was it a failure? Because again, what they did, what uh, Charles W. Eliot did, they decided that you could ask people to read 50, 60 large books. That cannot be done. Way too many. Right? Sort of, I am not arguing with their selection. Indeed, most of the books, which, for example, in, in um, great books, Serious are great books, no question about it. But asking a normal, yes? They were very different. This is an interesting question. The, they were done in a very different way. Uh, uh, Harvard Classics would include sort of small snippets. For example, <coughs> uh, he would include two or three plays by Shakespeare. Great books would include all the plays by Shakespeare. Right? He would include three dialogues by Plato. They included all of dialogues by Plato. So the, in spite of the approximately same size, 
51 versus 54, they were dramatically different. 54 were normal, 51 were normal books with normal font size. And with the grade books, what they decided is to do this wonderful thing. They said, well, why don't we put all the Shakespeare in one volume? Could you do it? Yes, you can, using a tiny font size. That's what they accomplished. They actually managed to put enormous amount of stuff in there by doing this two-column, very small font and covering sort of far greater depth. So there is some overlap, but realistically speaking, it's much more likely if you decide to read all of them that you will be able to read 51 Harvard classics than 54 grade books because just much, much harder and probably five times as much material because of the font size. Now we can put them all in Kindle. You can. The problem, <laughs> you can. You absolutely can. The problem is that, and that's the, the, the thing which we need to realize. We could put much more than that. Sort of one danger which faces us as a species that, right now. It's not the lack of books, but astonishing number of books which is given to us. Right? The, 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 the whole point of the canon is that any two people, when they meet, could talk to each other. They have something in common. Now, if you have million books on your Kindle, and Paul has another million, or it's the same million books on his Kindle. What's the likelihood that you read at least one book which is the same? Zero. Right? Sort of right now, we're facing this situation, and not just in computer science, in, in the society, that we do not share anything. Well, except the reality shows, but even those we don't because there are too many. It keeps shifting again. You forget. You cannot. So, but what I claim is that <coughs> the <coughs> <coughs> that for a canon to be effective, it has to be very small. What do I mean by small? small? Five, ten books. Right? Because if we go to dramatic numbers like 50, forget thousands, it becomes un, uh, un, unreasonable. So, and that is the sort of the continuation plan which I, I want to propose to you. I mean, you're done with me in terms of, you might see me again in different capacity, but I'll not be talking about mathematics. So, there is a great danger from my point of view that you will never even think of mathematics again. You say, Alex was quite entertaining, but I have a job to do by mathematics. And for many of you, that's what happened. I mean, you graduated from high school and you didn't do mathematics, or you graduated from college and you didn't do mathematics. I mean, we do not, we are accustomed not doing mathematics. It's actually quite a normal state. Sadly enough, even for mathematicians, I have many friends who are mathematicians who teach mathematics. And when I talk to them, they always say, oh, you know, all this stuff by which they mean mathematics, they have no time to read mathematics or to do mathematics. They do their stuff, whatever they do. But they have no time to, to sort of look, look at the old, beautiful, classical mathematics. So I have a proposal. I have a suggestion which I think might enable you to, to continue and continue well on this path. And that is by introducing a very, very small canon. A very, very small canon, which is I claim that there are two parts of mathematics all of you must know. I would actually go beyond that. I would say that people shouldn't be allowed to vote in the presidential elections unless they know this stuff. I'm dead serious. Because, you know, we, or at least we should 
aspire as a country that every citizen knows this stuff. But for sure, people who program should not be allowed to program unless they know these two things. And they're not particularly novel things. I'm not telling you that you should go and learn category theory. My friend Paul is going, after he abandons this, going to attend another talk at Google, where somebody else is going to tell them that you cannot program in JavaScript unless you know category theory. I'm not joking. This is true. And uh, is it true? Sort of true. <laughs> yeah. So it, it has both JavaScript and category theory. Yes. So, so I'm not telling you that you need to know category theory. You're welcome to if, if that's what you want. But I actually claim that you, know, you should aspire to maintain constant living knowledge of two areas of mathematics. And this is elementary algebra and elementary geography, uh, geometry. Why? Well, first of all, in, in case of algebra, I claim that when we program, you might have noticed, we use these things called x, y, sometimes z, or as our brothers from across the pond say, z. But, you know, we use x, y's, and z's. That's algebra. We manipulate x, y's, and z's. Supposed to use the wrong thing. <laughs> <laughs> OK. But you use names. You use names. So it could be my very long x or my very long y. But uh, whatever, whatever it is, that's what we do. And I, I, sometimes people ask me, so, well, they sit with me, program, and say, how do you notice these things? By which they notice that I sort of reorder lines and things go fast. And where did you learn it? And I claim that I learned it by doing elementary algebra. It's all elementary algebra. Okay? So this is why I claim it is of paramount importance. And why do I advocate Euclidean geometry? This is a much harder call, but let me tell you. All of you, of course, want to grow up and become architects. That's how I mean. People say, I'm not a programmer. I'm an architect. And by that, they mean that they are above just writing code. Uh, I don't know what it quite means, but if I could put any meaning to word architect, uh, Somehow, actually, I cannot because if you don't program, go into management. Uh, but you know. But if I could attach some meaning to word architect, is a person who could see deep structure of the thing. He could see how the top connects to the bottom. Who could see the whole picture. So you need to develop an architectural ability. And what I claim is that studying Euclidean geometry with its lemma-lemma theorem allows you to develop this ability. It's not the only path. For example, if you learn music theory and learn to read the score of Beethoven's say, Ninth Symphony, that will add great architectural ability also. However, geometry is easier. So I mean, in, in some sense, I, I claim that the easiest path to developing this large ability of seeing large structure so that everything has proportion, everything fits, is by studying this wonderful body of work which has this large structure and everything fits which is Euclidean geometry. You heard me talk about it before, but I, am, I actually mean it. Right? I, you know, I don't get any royalties from either algebra or geometry. I wish I did. I should have patented one of them. Jeff did. One. So, you know, piano arithmetic, I think, is proprietary. So, uh, but... Uh, I actually claim, and I, you know, this, this is that these two things would do much good. How do you go about it? What, you know, again, I promise something actionable. 
And I claim there is a very actionable thing. There are, at least in case of algebra, I have a book which I recommend, which will, if you stick to it for a long time, maybe for the rest of your life, will make you a very, very good programmer. It is by George Crystal. It's called Elementary Algebra. It's two large volumes. Uh, George Crystal was a student of Maxwell, the one who invented electricity, well, <laughs> the equations. Uh, and uh, he was a sort of followed the long path of other, I'll mention them in a second, uh, wonderful books done by, by people in England, many of them people in Cambridge. Cambridge in 19th century, while it was not the center of mathematical research, such as Göttingen, was a great center of research on mathematical physics. Uh, I'll, you know, but Cambridge and, you know, there are sort of two great universities in England, Oxford and Cambridge. But Cambridge somehow, through a mysterious set of historical events, established its priority in mathematics. You know, maybe it was because certain Isaac Newton, you might have heard, went there. Or maybe his uh, uh, teacher Barrow, who was there, who maybe invented calculus even before Newton. Uh, or, more likely, there was a dramatic decline of Cambridge in uh, 18th century. Not just Cambridge, entire British university system collapsed. Professors were not do lecturing, uh, often not even residing at a university, just collecting paychecks. Uh, students were drunk and disorderly. Things were terrible, 18th century. Uh, and then in 19th century, there was a great sort of growth of uh, British university system. And in Cambridge, they created this wonderful, wonderful way of teaching mathematics based around May, may very strange thing called mathematical tripus. Good. Uh, so, what was mathematical? Tripus in general is a three legged stool, stool like that, but with three legs. And during Middle Ages, to get your doctorate, you had to sit on a tripus and answer questions. So examination was often called a tripus. In case of Cambridge, it always was known as tripus, sitting on. Stools went away. Middle Ages went away. But in 19th century, this tripus examination became a legendary thing. The entire England was watching the examination. You know, everybody, I mean, it was a long three-day examination where people were put in linear order. Everybody who took it were linearly ordered, depending how well he did. And the first person, the best, was known as the senior wrangler, because wrangler, ar arguer, goes back to the senior uh, wrangler. The second was known as the second wrangler. And then there was a very place of distinction known as the wooden spoon, the one at the very bottom. So you could become famous by in three ways, by being the first, second, or the last. Uh, and when we look, if you sort of Google, you will see that many places where you find a list of all single senior wranglers. Many very great mathematicians came out of the list. And even second wranglers, there is a famous story about Thompson, later on, Lord Calvin, who was a brilliant student. And uh, after the tripus, he uh, uh, sent, uh, sent a servant to check who was the second wrangler. Or he was absolutely certain who was the first. And the servant comes back and says, oh, it's you, sir. Uh, which he was very disappointed. Uh, 
So, but he did well. He did well. He became a great physicist. But there are very many. So this system, which was rather pernicious in some sense, linear ordering of people, you know, publicly. Just imagine if management they're going to rank us uh, next week or whenever uh, December. I imagine that they put it on the wall. Uh, you find yourself being the wooden spoon. <laughs> You, know, you would be pleased, but that's how it went. So very, very competitive. You had to, to spend like three years practicing and practicing and practicing. And there were lots of people who became specialists just by drilling students. You couldn't just become successful unless you hired one of these specialists. It became a very special, specialized system. But no matter what, as a result, came out a whole bunch of very, very good textbooks. And Crystal is still one of them. I wish it could be modernized. Again, it's somewhat archaic language. It was written 120 years ago. Uh, some notation is different. But nevertheless, it's quite accessible, and it's quite wonderful. You could say, oh, well, I, I know algebra really well. I don't know about it. Do you really remember what Bernoulli numbers are? OK. If you don't, go. It's in there. How good are continued fractions computations? Lagrange theorem and continued fractions? No? It's all in there. It's a wonderful one. This is the real algebra. This is not the sort of castrated stuff which, which remains now. This is elementary algebra at its best. Wonderful. Which includes. Most of the number theory which I taught you is in there, done exceptionally well. Wonderful section of combinatorics, probability theory, many other things. Done in elementary way. It's all very elementary. But it's, it's an astonishing book. So do not assume that you know. It's, it's a very dangerous assumption in case of Crystal. Right? It's my opinion that very, very few people with graduate degrees in mathematics from best universities know this stuff nowadays. Again, they have no time. They're pushed to do algebraic topology or whatever. So they have no time to learn, learn this stuff. It's wonderful. And by the way, in case, for whatever reason, you do not like Crystal, there are some alternatives. There was another couple at Cambridge. These are alternative texts I still highly recommend Crystal, and mostly because it's reprinted by American Mathematical Society and easily available in a well done reprint. Right? That's why I put a pointer there from Amazon. There are multiple reprints, most of them of Crystal. Most of them are impossible, illegible, you know, because there are all these companies which specialize. <laughs> this is good. AMS does that. The problem with Hall and Knight, which is actually quite wonderful too, it's it's hard for Crystal is better, I think, but they 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 also two Cambridge guys slightly earlier than than uh, than Crystal, and it's wonderful, um, but I do not know of a single reprint which I could recommend. They're all sort of fuzzy, you know, the 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 bad reprints. Uh, I have original. So if you could find original on uh, AB, uh, that, that's clearly worthwhile. And there are, again, there is a wonderful tradition uh, of the, this text again. You know. uh, I, I think that uh, if you see them in a used garage sale or something, it's worth picking them up. Uh, there was a great guy called Todd Hunter. Another Cambridge guy, and he was the senior wrangler in his year. So after sort of winning the tripos, he stayed at Cambridge and published, I think, about 20 different textbooks on all subjects under the sun. Mechanics, elasticity theory. Uh, he was very good in history of mathematics, published a bunch of stuff, and published a very good uh, algebra for use of colleges. So if you see that. And George Peacock, I cannot resist putting it there, because this was maybe the first 
of this English tradition. Uh, uh, and he managed to teach people like De Morgan. So it's, he was an important guy, and it's an important text. And while I do not recommend it, I have to mention it. The first book on elementary algebra was, which in modern elementary algebra, not modern algebra, was written by Euler. Remember Euler? So Euler decided that it's worthwhile writing this text which will make every person understand algebra, not just arithmetic. And uh, did I tell you the story? I didn't tell you the story? Okay. So, and at that time he was in Berlin but was planning to go back to Moscow. Remember he was sort of Moscow, Berlin, Moscow. What did I say, Moscow? I lied. St. Petersburg, Berlin, St. Petersburg. Never lived in Moscow. I lived in Moscow. Uh, but I am not Euler, unfortunately. Uh, so, uh, so he is in Berlin and plans to go to, to St. Petersburg. And uh, he decided that he also wants to write this textbook on algebra so that everybody could learn algebra. Everyone. Therefore, he wants to write it in a way that everyone could understand it. So he came up with a grand plan. He hired a valet. You know, valet is the guy who brushes your suit when you go home, ask your valet to brush it. So uh, he asked the, the, he hired a valet who was literate, knew German very well, but didn't know any mathematics. And he decided to dictate his book on algebra to the valet. The idea being that what the valet, if valet writes it and understands it, anybody else can. And that's how he did it. So he wrote it in, in uh, German. It was quickly translated into just about every European language. And it uh, became a standard book by, say, 1770, everybody in Europe sort of had it. Then Euler dies, and uh, there is a guy who succeeded in Euler's sort of position as the most important mathematician. That's Lagrange. And Lagrange says, Euler's algebra needs to be extended with some more material. What does he do? Does he write a new textbook? No. He says, I'm going to write a supplement to Euler's book. So it comes with Lagrange's supplement. And then later on, Daniel Bernoulli, the distant nephew twice removed, whatever, of great Bernoulli, decides to extend the text. And again, they work on, he works on Euler. So sort of this classical book of Euler extended by Lagrange, extended by Bernoulli, is still a very great book. But in your case, Crystal. You have to know that the tradition goes back to Euler, but I still recommend Crystal. The problem, so we, we, covered, we covered algebra. And again, how do I mean, let me, I, before I go switch to geometry, why not going to have a break? We'll just go and then finish earlier, okay? You're not going to run out of tape? Good. So uh, the what, what, uh, what I need to do is how do you do it? There are two ways. One way is to say, I'll sit in one sitting, read it from beginning. That's not going to work. You'll run out of steam and you'll get bored. So what you need to do, you need to acquire a habit of doing it a little bit at the time, preferably every day. Remember, there is no deadline. I mean, it's two, two big volumes, but there is no deadline. You really don't need to be done by Friday or a year from Friday or whenever. So if you learn to do 15 minutes and view it as it were as a just nice thing which you do every day, maybe 20 minutes, it will eventually become a pleasurable thing. You will get used to it. Right? It's like people who 
we get used where as a child you don't want to brush your teeth. Your parents have to say, go brush your teeth, at least to me. And then eventually I nobody needs to tell me to brush my teeth. I got used to it. It is actually pleasant. It. I don't mind it anymore. The same thing with with <coughs> say, doing crystal. If you start doing it every day, a little bit at the time, going through all the problems. Again, the beauty of crystal is many, many problems. And there are solutions at the end, by the way, you could check. You eventually will start loving it. It's going to be easy. Right? So you say, I'm too old. Well, nobody's too old. Right? It's, you know, I think I told you that Jefferson, when he turned old, he stopped reading newspapers, started reading Euclid. He found that it's more pleasant. He wasn't such an idiot after all. So uh, maybe it's good for you. So this is one. Do it continuously a little bit. Do not set high goals. There is, do not set any goals for that matter. Just do it whatever natural speed there is. The problem is much harder, however, with in case of geometry. There are many modern books on geometry. And I know, I cannot say I know them all since then. Nobody could know all the books on any subject. Though. But I know all the great classics. And the great mathematicians tried to improve on Euclid. Like Legendre wrote a famous text on geometry, which was used for decades. Then in early 20th century, Jacques Damar a very great French mathematician wrote two volume text. Russian Kolmogorov tried. Nevertheless, I still claim that in some fundamental architectural sense, Euclid is the best. And there exists, as I told you, this great translation, very inexpensive, with extensive commentaries. So I do recommend it, however, Unlike crystal, it's harder because Euclid wrote his text presupposing the teacher. Right? It, it's not crystal you could do on your own. It's much harder to do Euclid on your own. There's no problems. So I could say that if it doesn't work, it should work, well, let me put it like that. Everybody should attend, at least attempt to get number one, which contains books one and two of Euclid, and work through at least book one of Euclid, basically all the way to Pythagoras' theorem. It's, uh, you know, it's necessary. It's just, and it's beautiful. It could be done, I think. If you find that you have difficulty, which it might be, there is another wonderful thing, which I recommend at least to one person here, Brian. Uh, there is a 19th century edition of Euclid by Oliver Byrne, which is done using visual thing instead of formal thing. And it makes it much more accessible for many people. So this is the step number two. If normal Euclid doesn't work, this might, because it's also very, very pretty. It looks somewhat fuzzy here. But the book is beautifully printed. And it is in print. It was, it was, it was not in print for 150 years. But fortunately for you, two years ago, uh, Taschen, a German publisher, decided to reprint it in a very, very beautiful way. And the company for which we work sells it for some unbelievable price, such as 39 bucks, for one of the most beautiful books ever printed. So that is an, another possibility. Yes? That's the, that's the, the second thing. And then finally, the third thing, if neither works, there is a book anybody should be able to read. However, it will not give you the architectural sense of the original. But nevertheless, it's their sort of <coughs> fallback position. 
it's a book by Birhoff and Beatley called Basic Geometry. It's, it's not Euclid, but if you cannot do Euclid, at least do that. That is, I rather you do that than nothing at all. Right? And uh, now, I'm actually done with slides, but I'm not quite done. Now I have to still give you a pitch. Sort of, the pitch is very simple. As I said in the beginning of the course, I believe that we are heirs to this great tradition. That we are not, we are not just, you know, fly by night guys who were found to, to do some something, and programming is this great successor to mathematics. Uh, few of us are going to be Hilberts, but that's something which we need to, to accept. That is, you could do. Mathematics, you could do programming without being Hilbert. You could do programming without being Ken Thompson. Right? But you still could do it very, very well. But if the, we are not obligated to be smarter than we are. What we are obligated is do as well as we can. You see the difference? Which is, you know, I'm not judged compare with somebody else. The competition is not with somebody else. This is difficult. We live in this competitive world, so we think that I have to compete with Ryan. And, you know, it's either me or him. No, the competition is not with Ryan. The competition is with myself. It is I have to do the best I can. When I write code, it has to be the best code I can write. Again, people would disagree, and some people would say, no, sometimes not when you write in Python. No, when you write in Python a script which is going to run only once, it still should be the best script you should write, you could write. It's a different notion of the best. Again, probably you do not want to optimize microseconds, but the notion of elegance, the notion of correctness, the notion of sort of doing things right still applies to this one time, I mean, a good programmer should never write bad code. I'm not trying to say a good programmer should always write high performance code. That is different. But sort of trying, trying to view it as, as our, I mean, sometimes, you know, I don't want to single any organization out, but sometimes over, say, the last 10 years, I've been different organizations, and I had to, whether I liked it or not, read real code. You heard of this thing called real code. And sometimes you look at it and you say, how could he write it? Or she, or whomever wrote it. I mean, it's, it's just wrong. You don't write things like that. And I think that's, you know, that's what we need all to strive. We have to strive to, to do the best we can do. Again, not competing with, with other people, and just doing the right thing. And to do that, again, I think that learning some mathematics would help a little bit. It's not the end. Again, not every mathematician could write good code. But I am yet to meet a good programmer who didn't know elementary algebra. Sort of after that, I would like to conclude the course. Thank you, guys.